Hello and welcome to this special Facebook Live episode of The Peace Frequency, a podcast series tapping into the stories of people across the globe who are making peace possible and finding ways to create a world without violence. I'm your host, Darren Cambridge. And on today's episode, we are broadcasting from the United States Institute of Peace in Washington, DC. And the timing of this episode bridges two months of particular significance and importance. Uh, February was African American History Month and March is Women's History Month. And on today's episode, we are going to explore the role and influence of African American men and women on the field of international peace and conflict resolution roles that have for too long been marginalized or underrepresented. And we have two phenomenal outstanding guests who are gonna join us to unpack the following questions. So as all of you watching on Facebook and our small studio audience in the room here, these are a couple questions that we want you to think about as we have this, this conversation. Um, first of all, how have black men and women shaped and influenced the fields of conflict resolution and peace building? Who are the individuals from history and from today that are making significant impacts on how we prevent violent conflict and how we build peace? And then last, what can their stories teach us about bringing more African American men and women into the fields of peace and conflict resolution? So again, we have two outstanding guests. First, we have Ambassador Edward Perkins. Ambassador Perkins was the first African-American ambassador to South Africa from the years 1986 to 1989. He also served as ambassador to Liberia, Australia, and the United Nations. He was also the Director General of the Foreign Service. So Ambassador Perkins, it's an honor to have you with us today. Glad to be with you. We're also joined by Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield. From 2008 to 2012, she was ambassador to Liberia, she also served as the Director General of the Foreign Service from 2012 to 2013. And her most recent position in government was as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. And she is currently Distinguished Resident Fellow of African Studies at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. So Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, thank you for being with us. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. So we start all of our conversations on the podcast with a uh, behind the bio question. And it's a question that in your response will hopefully reveal something about your inspirations, your motivations, your character. Also something that people wouldn't learn about you looking at bios that they find of you online on Wikipedia and the respective organizations that you've worked for. And one thing that I discovered as I was learning about you prior to this episode is that not only were both of you ambassadors to Liberia, both of you were the Director General of the Foreign Service, but you both were born and raised in the great state of Louisiana. <laughs> so uh, my behind the bio question to both of you is, I want you to think about your roots in Louisiana, and if you could share with us what aspect of, the, of those roots do you still feel connected to today? Ambassador Perkins, why don't we start with you? I think uh, I would start with, uh, understanding what a sense of community means. I, I spent the first seven, eight years on a farm owned by my grandparents in uh, northern Louisiana. And since I was the uh, youngest person in the family, I did a lot of uh, work that I wasn't prepared to do, at least emotionally I wasn't prepared to do it. Uh, things like uh, hoeing, things like peanuts and corn and uh, potatoes, alfalfa. It was uh, it was a, a never-ending place of work. However, I worked with my grandmother. Or she worked with me. She had about uh, 10 children, and uh, all of them at one time or another spent some time at a small college in Louisiana. She insisted they all get an education. And that was not necessarily uh, successful for her. 
they all, many of them wanted to go their own way, including my mother, who uh, left that little college and found herself a, a preacher and got married and got pregnant and uh, almost got disowned by her mother. But uh, her uh, husband was not all that much of a good Nick. And uh, they soon parted and she went back to the farm. But she didn't assume the uh, motherhood kind of a role. So I grew up thinking my uh, grandmother was really the mother. But I also did a lot of work on the farm. My, grand, my grandfather kept saying, uh, this is your home, you learn it. You'll always be, you'll always have enough to eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know any better at that time. But he also had three sons, all three of whom uh, he was disappointed in because they d did not take over the farm. But the community in which I grew up in, there's a black community, with four or five whites who owned farms around. So I'd say a sense of community and what community means was one of the lessons. The other was that uh, if you want to eat, you have to work for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Ambassador, what about you? What roots do you still feel connected to? You know, it's, it, it's interesting uh, listening at Ambassador Perkins because uh, there are a lot of sim similarities. I grew up in a small rural community. I was the oldest of eight children. Uh, both of uh, my parents were uh, illiterate and underemployed, and, uh, but they raised their kids for success. And we all knew that the community was looking out for all of us. And being the oldest of eight, I learned to, to do some things that have stuck with me. Uh, I still consider myself an amazing cook. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my description of my, uh, my cooking. Uh, and I still uh, cook for 20 people, uh, even though it's just my husband and when uh, we were early married, two kids. But uh, we had monster truck pots uh, where we would cook amazingly large meals to feed the community. And my mother was well known for her cooking, and she cooked for the community. Uh, she took in a, a family when I was in high school who had lost both uh, of their parents, and there were eight kids in that family, and they were going to divide them up and send them to various um, um, uh, homes. And my mother said, I will take them. And they lived next door. My mother cooked for all eight of them and all eight of us. So every single day, we, we ate together as, as a family. And my son said to me one day, because I would always send him down to Louisiana, that he loved to go to Louisiana because Momo, uh, the name we call my grandmother, Momo could even make fat taste good. <laughs> Uh, and I, I grew up not knowing I was poor. I, I didn't mm. realize how poor I was until I left the community mm. uh, because everybody in the community were, were the same and there were some people who were better off than, than others, uh, some people who had better houses than others, but we were all part of one community. We were all related to each other. And that small community called Leland College is still there. It's still segregated. Uh, many of uh, the older people have died and the children are, are still there. My family is still in the community and when I go home, I'm one of the few people in that community that actually left to go out of state. Many have moved farther afield in, in outside the Baton Rouge area, but I left and went out of, of state and out of the country even. And so when I go home, I'm kind of a celebrity. Mm. Uh, people didn't figure out what I was doing for probably 30 years until I became an ambassador. And then they figured that maybe I was doing something important that they ought to pay attention to. Uh, but I have uh, grown to uh, appreciate the strong community spirit that existed. My father who died uh, in 2010 was considered the patriarch of, of the entire community. He was one of the old timers who remained in the community and raised his kids in the community. And uh, the community, uh, came to very much appreciate uh, the role that he played. Interesting, interesting. You know, I, I can connect with the, the cooking, and I don't know if you both feel the same way, but 
doing this work in foreign policy, international affairs, a lot of the fruits of our labor we may never see or you don't immediately feel, but the art of cooking is I have something in front of me, I immediately transform it, it immediately feeds people, I get that feedback, and sometimes I feel like cooking for friends or family is a way to get um, a sense that I'm having some type of impact immediately um, you know, on, a, on, a daily, on a daily basis. I, I do something that I call gumbo diplomacy. Mm. Uh, so I would uh, welcome people to, to my home, and they kind of have to participate in the process of developing this meal. Uh, and as a diplomat, I could have very high-level ministers in my house chopping on onions, and, and I always <laughs> gave the onions to them to chop, uh, but then learn all kinds of things about what's happening in the country and develop those friendships and those long-term relationships that I think contributed to making me a successful diplomat. That's great. That's great. I want to remind those of you who are watching on Facebook um, that you are more than welcome to ask your own questions of our guests, provide your own comments. My colleague Stephen Reuter is moderating the discussion comment section, so he'll let us know when you have a question. So at any point during our conversation, feel free to chime in. Same goes for our studio audience here um, in the room. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring a mic to you. Um, so, kind of growing out of your um, lives in Louisiana, I'm interested to hear what initially sparked your interest in going into international affairs. Was there a moment or was there a specific individual that you can recall tapping into that desire that then sent you on your, your journey? Bass, we to start with you. Um, I don't think there is uh, necessarily one thing uh, in Louisiana. Um, I did not see a lot of people who had anything to do with uh, foreign affairs, uh, affairs outside of uh, that little community of Hainesville where I spent some years. But I did meet some people. One of them, turns out, was uh, t uh, was a foreign service officer later in life from this little town. Uh, I never knew him, of course. But when he went into the foreign service, he wrote a, a column for the local newspaper on the inside looking in. He talked a little bit about his career. And I remembered that and wondered how could a person from Haynesville, Louisiana, get to Washington, D.C. Is he African-American? No, he was not. No, okay. That was another issue that I had to come to terms with. Mm. So I discussed that with my uh, grandmother and uh, my aunt. And my grandmother said, listen, uh, there are some things that uh, you may not be able to get in your lifetime. You've got to figure out what those are and do the things that you, th you think are possible. So I said, uh, I'd like to get out of uh, this little village of Haynesville and uh, move someplace else. And she said, uh, listen, just study. She had uh, collected all of the textbooks that her children brought back home. And she had her oldest daughter as my uh, tutor especially in English and mathematics, which I came to appreciate much later on in life. But it was, uh, it was like being a, uh, in a classroom. And that classroom included, I would say, outreach to things that I had never heard of before. And I don't even know whether my grandmother had heard of them either. And then diplomacy came on the line as a, as a word diplomacy. And so I looked it up and it said reaching out to others in, in uh, support of your own country. And uh, so I read a little bit more and found a few books actually that talked about this concept of diplomacy. And how old are you at this point? You're in your teen, teen yeah, I was, years? Okay. I was about uh, 10. Okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. uh, but I, don't, I won't say that this led to any kind of okay. conclusion. But the books that she collected and she kept 
and made me read were books that also touched other subjects. One of them, um, uh, young people like you of course, and, and Linda would not remember them, but it was uh, Little Women, uh, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. And in that book were some references to the outside world, which I came, came to uh, later def uh, define as uh, diplomacy, uh, getting away and representing some element of your country. I was not nearly as eloquent as I may appear today, but uh, I wanted to get out of Louisiana, and I wanted to do some further study, and I didn't know what that really meant, but I knew that I had to get away from Louisiana if I was ever, ever going to uh, see diplomacy. You know, I have a very interesting story, and I only realized this much later in, in life, but in 1966, uh, my little segregated community was jolted into uh, the international world when Peace Corps uh, decided to come to Leland College, uh, where there was a college, an old HBCU, that had closed down. It was a Baptist missionary church uh, school. Uh, university, uh, and they used that facility to train Peace Corps volunteers who were going to Africa. And the volunteers were going to Somalia and Swaziland. I was in eighth grade. And uh, these group of young hippie-like Americans, uh, white people that we had never seen before, um, came into our community with uh, African teachers from Somalia and Swaziland. And they invited the kids in the community to come on campus after school to learn uh, the language. And so I went on campus uh, every evening after school to learn to speak Saswati. I don't remember a word now. Uh, <laughs> but it opened my eyes that there was a world beyond uh, uh, Baker, Louisiana, or Leland College, where, where I grew up. And I would fast forward a few years and go to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, and one of the people in an audience one evening was the Saswati teacher who had lived in my community, and I introduced myself to her, and we became lifelong friends. And I still had not decided at that point that I was going to go into diplomacy. I still didn't know I had not been introduced to that uh, career. Uh, but I would uh, eventually go to Africa to study, uh, to Liberia, and uh, that's where I became acquainted with uh, the foreign affairs community. Uh, met my husband who was working at the embassy, the US embassy at that time, and then was introduced to the possibility of a career in, in the foreign service. So that's a long way of answering. I don't think it started uh, with uh, my eighth grade experience, mm -hmm. uh, but that was the bug that uh, lit the, the fire under me. Interesting. I'd love to hear from folks who are watching uh, on Facebook if you can recall a particular moment or an individual, if you are in the field of international affairs or you want to go into the Foreign Service, was there a bug or was there a moment that kind of sparked that initial interest? We'd love for you to, to share that on, on Facebook if you so choose. Um, I wanted to jump uh, a little bit to history now and, and look at uh, an African-American foreign policy icon um, that some people may be familiar with. He was the first African-American recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, actually. His name is Ralph Bunch. And he has an interesting story and a fascinating contribution to how we understand the world today, particularly human rights. After World War II, he was part of a group of individuals that started forming the idea of the United Nations. So the charter conference that put together the document that created the United Nations. He was one of those individuals that was part of it. Um, he went on to do mediation in the Israel-Palestine conflict, which is what eventually awarded him the Nobel Peace Prize. And he also worked with Eleanor Roosevelt in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And if we could bring up um, on the screen to show folks on, on Facebook a picture we have of Ralph Bunch and a quote that he shared in 1950 when he gave his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. 
And the quote is as follows. Ralph Bunch said, peace is no mere matter of men fighting or not fighting. Peace to have meaning for many who have known only suffering in both peace and war must be translated into bread or rice, shelter, health, and education, as well as freedom and human dignity, a steadily better life. If peace is to be secure, long-suffering and long-starved, forgotten peoples of the world, the underprivileged and the undernourished, must begin to realize without delay the promise of a new day and a new life. This is in 1950. Uh, again, just seeing the emergence of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I want to turn to our guest and hear what your experience has been in advancing and protecting and standing up for human rights as ambassadors and how that work of standing up for human rights has evolved, if at all, in the time that you've been in the Foreign Service. Um, ambassador Perkins, let's start with you. Well, that's a, quite a large question. <laughs> I, would, I would start off by saying that uh, human rights uh, came to uh, be, a, be a part of my, my schema, so to speak. Uh, or I put it another way, I would say, uh, how am I going to approach my responsibility as a diplomat today? And I looked upon every day as an opportunity, but also as a challenge and a danger as well. I don't think I really quite understood the range of, of uh, hatred are, I guess, in, in consideration that can encase a person, a community, a family, or a government until I went abroad. And then I began to compare things I found abroad with things that were happening here in the United States. Um, I think perhaps the uh, journey of equality, so to speak, in this country amongst men and women um, began a long time ago. It's been slow at times, and sometimes seemingly fast, but never fast, never too fast. And I realized as soon as I uh, spent a, a few days in another country, in this case it was uh, Ghana, and then I began to ask myself, what am I doing here? Because I was a political counselor there. I said, what do political counselors do? And I began to travel around the country and met a lot of people, traveled alone, um, Never had any kind of uh, escort. But I got a lot of questions of this black American who's uh, traveling alone. And they wanted to know what I thought about their country. And what are some of the things that you think you can do to make us like you and your country better? That you're a black American. What kind of a sales pitch? <laughs> what kind of a sales pitch can you present that will make sense? Because you come from a country that is notorious for denying people their rights as, as human beings. And there I learned not only to answer questions like that, but to admit and learn, admit that my own country had a long way to go and that I should never, ever shy from saying it. I needed to understand what that really meant, how it started. <clears throat> I got a copy of the Constitution and 
begin to memorize it, and then to find uh, words that others had written about certain parts of the Constitution. The bottom line was, Perkins, if you do not understand what it means to be a citizen of the United States with all of its inadequacies and pluses too, then you can't be a diplomat because you're, you're, you're going out among the people. They're gonna ask you a lot of questions. And what do you say to that? Uh, I would say that that was one of the greatest lessons I think I learned about myself and uh, that I needed to do other things, learn other things in order to, in order to make a, a saleable pitch, I guess, a saleable pitch to those whom I was trying to convince that the United States had a role to play in their country and in the world, and we need support to do that. And here you are, I'm giving you my pitch. And now I realize silently that they were saying, I, I wonder if he really understands where he came from. And a little later on, I was to learn that there are a lot of people who asked that question to themselves when they would see me. You came from the United States, a country that uh, is notorious for uh, denying people human rights, and you're selling human rights to us. How can you do that? And that question reverberated uh, again and again within my own uh, repertoire, I guess. So it has never been far away from my little globe of things that I need to know and need to talk about mm -hmm. and think about even today. Mm -hmm. Sir Thomas Greenfield, what, yeah. what about you? I, I was thinking about this as, as he asked, and growing up in the community I was growing up in, we were comfortable in our isolation and comfortable in our segregation. And I didn't realize the extent to which our human rights were being violated until Peace Corps came into our community with Africans and they forced this little community to open up some doors that had never been opened for the black people in the community. Uh, we accepted the for white only signs and the black signs on water fountains and going into the doctor's office, going through the back door. We accepted it because that's all we knew until Peace Corps came. And so they initiated protest in our, in our community uh, to ensure that the local laundromat would allow the Africans who were with them to come in to wash their clothes. And when they did that, they opened it up for the rest of the community. And so I was very conscious of this from a very young age. And when I, would, when I eventually left uh, Louisiana and eventually found myself in Liberia in the 1970s, working in small communities and seeing the disparities in those communities identified with the downtrodden, uh, always, not the, the elite or the upper class. I made myself uh, become one of the downtrodden uh, to understand where they were coming from and eventually would come into the Foreign Service with that concept and that idea. And I spent most of the first years of my career working in humanitarian uh, work, uh, working with refugees, working with displaced, working with uh, people who, uh, whose human rights uh, had been violated uh, by their governments. And it became for me a, a, a goal in life to do something every day that would improve the lives of others. It became part of our foreign policy, I think, eventually during the, the, um, the Carter years, but eventually we started writing human rights reports. It became a part of what we promoted as U.S. national interests. It became part of our values that we promoted in, in, in our foreign policy. But for me personally, it was always there. It was always part of the way I thought. And one of the things that I was most proud of when I was in Liberia, 
uh, I felt that my job was not just to represent the U.S. government to the government of Liberia. My job was to represent the people of the United States to the people of Liberia. So I spent a lot of time in markets, on the streets, talking to, uh, to poor people and trying to understand why they were where they were and to give them hope. Uh, I remember sitting in a, uh, a graduating class and there were a, a lot of mothers who were so proud that their kids were graduating. And I asked the question in the room, how many of you mothers can read and write? And there was just silence and there was embarrassment as I looked out at their faces. And I said, I'm not trying to embarrass you. My mother and father could not read and write. Uh, my mother got her high school diploma in 1989, 19 years after I got my high school diploma from the segregated school that I couldn't go to. So there's hope for you mothers in the room. And the school that day started a reading program for adults. And I'm still getting reports from that school of the number of adults that they have taught to read and write since I gave that speech. And so for me, it's, it's part of my psyche, it's part of my makeup to look for how, as an individual, I can make a difference in somebody's life every single day. Mm -hmm. That's powerful, that's powerful. I wanted to talk about another individual from history that ties with a lot of what you all just shared. Because what I was hearing a little bit was a full-on awareness of what was happening domestically here in this country as you all began your professional journey working abroad understanding or getting a fuller picture of human rights and how they're being violated in other parts of the world, but at the same time, there are serious issues here in um, the United States, particularly with um, black communities. Um, so I'm, I'm sensing a little bit of a, a, a grappling with that as you went in your career. And so I wanted to bring up the next slide of a woman by the name of Edith Sampson. Um, and Edith Sampson was the first African-American delegate to the United Nations, um, and she was the first African-American representative to uh, NATO. And an absolutely fascinating uh, woman who had uh, an amazing career as a judge prior to any of her international work. And the reason that I wanted to bring her up is not only her contributions to international affairs and the influence that she had, but also in learning about her and reading some of the things that she said throughout her career, I was hearing some things that are similar to what you all just shared. So I'll, we have a couple quotes that we have up um, on the screen now. And in 1949, Edith Sampson was part of a uh, around the world town meeting um, tr uh, trip. And she, along with a couple dozen other Americans, traveled around the world to different countries and met with world leaders. So these are prominent Americans that were sent around the world, and they engaged in political debates and radio broadcasts with these world leaders. And again, this was in 1949, so inevitably, um, she, as an African American, was going to get a question around, well, what are your thoughts on how African Americans are treated in your country? And she was aware that oftentimes these questions would be coming as, as an attempt to uh, advance uh, communist propaganda. And so she said on a radio broadcast, I believe, quote, I would rather be a Negro in America than a citizen in any other land. And that got a lot of people back here in the United States, I think, to, to perk up a little bit and said, oh, I want to learn a little bit more about this Edith Sampson woman. Um, but then fast forward about 10 years later, 1960, she's giving a graduation speech at a high school. And she said, quote, we have convinced ourselves because it seems so necessary that the battle against injustice could be won piece by piece through changes in law, through court appeals, through persistent but cautious pressures. We were mistaken. No, we were wrong. Ours was not the only way. It was not even the best way. Now, I have my own interpretation of this <laughs> in terms of what type of evolution she may have gone through between 1949 and 1960 when she started traveling the world and was representing the United States. Um, but she's also an African-American woman who has uh, an experience that is unique to that identity. And so my question to both of you is, did you ever struggle with that as you got into the field of foreign policy, recognizing that 
there were injustices and rights that were being violated here in the United States, uh, specifically within the black community, communities in which you grew up in, um, yet or and your profession takes you overseas to other parts of the world when there were still struggles happening here in the United States. And I ask this because I think this is something that a lot of people of color, African Americans in particular, struggle with if, when they're deciding, do I go into international affairs or foreign policy? There's so many issues here in this country that I can put my energy towards. Why would I do it overseas when there's so much work to be done here? How did you all wrestle with that question, if at all? Ambassador Perkins? It's, excuse me, it's, it's certainly, uh, it's a question that's always been with us, whether we are diplomats or our neighborhood people. I think that uh, I probably saw it clearer, I guess, because it was always with me. When I uh, went off to South Africa to be an ambassador for the, for the United States, I was very much aware that I'd had, I'd had a, uh, a wide-ranging conversation with, with uh, President Reagan at the time solo, it was just Reagan and myself talking. And he had uh, been convinced by the Secretary of State that uh, we really ought to make our ambassador to South Africa a change agent in South Africa, unhindered by words from the President or Secretary of State. Let's find somebody and send them there. Uh, and let them do what they need to do. And this is, this is 1986. South Africa is still very much an apartheid, fully committed apartheid government. Absolutely. And Reagan is saying, we want to change agent and center. So continue. Um, I don't think the president had that idea by himself. I think Schultz gave him that idea. OK. <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, nevertheless, um, he met with me one Saturday morning for about two hours, two and a half hours, I guess, at the White House, uh, in the Oval Office. Actually, it was in the um, Lincoln Room. And he said, look, uh, George tells me that uh, uh, we cannot sit idly by as a nation and have people protesting that here in our country, our citizens protesting what's going on in South Africa and not do anything. And what we ought to be doing is trying to change things. This is George Schultz is saying this. And, uh, and I don't know what Reagan said to him, but uh, the next thing I knew, I was uh, in the hot seat, uh, asked to come back to Washington and. I was, I was at my first post, uh, I guess, Liberia. But my point is that Schultz and Reagan together, I guess, but certainly Schultz, realized that uh, the United States, in order to have a coherent policy towards any nation or towards a lot of nations needs to be a change agent when necessary. And how do you, how do you be a change agent? Well, Schultz told me when he talked to me about this, he said, I told the president we need to find uh, the, the most likely person who would be a change agent for the President of the United States without the President giving him any instructions. And uh, Schultz said, I then went around and asked for several lists of people who might fit that. And then I, I changed it and said, 
we are looking for a black American foreign service officer to do this. And I'd get these, these lists, and he said, you know something? Your name was on every one of them. And so I said to myself, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then I got a call again from the secretary. He said, look, I've told, I've told the president that we have to do something in South Africa. We can't sit idly by, have a relationship with a country that uh, has this uh, segregationist system in place. And then we have American citizens protesting here in this country, in this city, against that. And he said, I want to send your name over to the president, because I think maybe you might be the person to go. But the president said he wants to interview you. And that was that Saturday morning. The president asked me every possible question he could think of, some I didn't think he even knew about. One of them was, where were you born? And he wanted to know about northern Louisiana. He wanted to know about grandmother, grandfather. And uh, how, how did you get out of that place, he said. <laughs> and I said, well, I ended up in a place called Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He said, where is that? And I, I told him that my mother and her husband were there, and that's where my grandmother said I had to go and to get out of the community. He said it was a good thing, right? I said, yes, it was. He said, look, George Ross is sending you to South Africa. He thinks maybe a black American foreign service officer would be able to do the kinds of things that we try to do from here. So if I send you, what are you going to do? Oh, I, I said, uh, <laughs> Mr. President, I, I am uh, aware that uh, the black people of South Africa consider you to be a racist. And uh, he said, what do you think? I said, well, uh, I, I don't think you quite understand the problem that the blacks in South Africa have. And what's South Africa? has in terms of its troubles for the future. I said, so if, I, uh, if you send me, I would uh, try to convince the black people that maybe there's an ally in you for change. He said, yeah, how are you going to do it? And so I said, well, I'll, I'll travel to all the communities and get to know as many people as possible. He said, what if the, what if the uh, blacks won't talk to you in representing me? I said, uh, well, I'll keep trying. He said, what about the white people? I said, they have a stake in the country as well. I said, but they can't take it all. I said, it has to be a kind of a uh, share all, and I'll be promoting that as well. Yeah, he talked for another hour, asking questions back and forth. I must tell you that it was, I've never been more surprised in my life. I just didn't think that this president had, had all that in him to sit there with me with no, nobody handing him any notes or anything like that. Well, it was all over, and he said, okay, thank you very much for coming. And you had uh, John Poindexter and Don Regan, his sometimes chief of staff, with him. But they sat in the back room and never said a word. He said, OK, this, this is it. I'm going to Camp David. I'd ask you to come out to the plane to see me off. But it's not time for you to. So I bring up this story to say this. South Africa was uh, clearly a challenge for me that uh, I, I never even thought existed. But then when I got there, I realized that my own understanding of where my country fits 
is on trial in my, in my mind as well. And it didn't take long for an Africana to give, give a major speech about, about this crazy ambassador who thinks his country is perfect and ours is not. I then gave a speech the next day talking about the imperfections of the United States. And uh, sometimes efforts to try and change it. I said, but the real issue is, what do we try to do? And do we really believe it? I said, I believe in what I'm doing in South Africa. So I think apartheid is wrong, and here's why it's wrong. And the imperfections in the United States are open and wide for everybody to see. And we have a lot of people, more and more every day, who are saying this is wrong. And uh, so I would say that South Africa presented to me a side of myself that I didn't even know existed. And that is that if you really want to support the rights of humans, you've got to practice them all the time, every day, and what you do. And South Africa brought that front and center to me in a way that nothing else could have done. Every day, it was that way. Wow, thank you, thank you for that. Um, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, I wanna phrase the question a little bit differently um, for you. I was talking about Edith Sampson, she gave this um, graduation speech at this high school, and I learned um, about you that you gave a commencement address at the high school that you were not allowed to go to when you were a kid growing up because it was an all-white school and this was um, during a time of segregation and so you went and gave the the graduation speech or the commencement speech at at the school that you yourself were not allowed to attend because you were black um, could you take us to that <laughs> moment what what was that like for you, and what did you share with those young people at that speech, given the history that you had in that community and how things had changed from when you were a student to now you're giving the commencement address at this, at this school? Uh, that was an interesting moment because as we were sitting on the stage and I was talking to the principal, she didn't realize that I had not graduated from Baker High School. So they had invited me back to speak as a graduate of the school because uh, uh, the segregation ended officially in Louisiana in 1970. And I graduated from high school in 1970 in May. So starting in September of 1970, all of my brothers and sisters went to Baker High School. Okay. Um, and so as I'm sitting there, I said to her, I always wanted to come into this auditorium and she looked at me and she said, is this the first time you're here? And I said, yes, this is the first time I'm here. She said, what year did you graduate? I said, I graduated in 1970 from Northwestern High School in Zachary, the town down the road. I couldn't come to Baker High School. So I think she was in shock. She didn't know, quite know what I was going to say in my speech. Uh, and so I stood up and I said to the students that uh, for my entire life, I was bused for segregation and that I took a bus every morning past Baker High School, past Zachary High School, the town down the road, to go to Northwestern High School, the only school that African Americans were allowed to go to uh, in 1970, although there were a handful who were, whose parents were brave enough to send their kids to school uh, before uh, the segregation was officially ended. And I talked about the experience of having books that were secondhand books from Baker High School at my school. But I also talked about the fact that I had the experience of having some of the best teachers in the world. Uh, they were teachers who cared about me. There were teachers who, if I decided to say a bad word at school, which I did, who would come and knock on my mother's door uh, because they lived in the community with us. Uh, and uh, they cared about our, our success. And that while I had gone to a segregated school, I thought that I had become the person I was because I'd gone to that school. And that we'd fast forward 
this year and suddenly I'm looking out at the audience at the school and it's 90% black, black kids. And I said to them, you have opportunities that I didn't have and I want you to take advantage of, of those opportunities and that you have to take this and make the best of it and make something of your lives. Uh, and I asked my mother to stand up, uh, who was there, and said, my mother graduated from this school in 1989. Uh, she got her GED, and she marched with the class of 1989. And that's how far we had come in all of those many years. I don't remember the year that I gave the, uh, uh, the address, but it was probably 20 plus years later. And, uh, and I think, again, that was the first time that uh, the school had grappled with their history. Mm. And the school understood the history that they, uh, that they had built in this community. Uh, and I shared with them that there was a school across the street. Uh, it was a Baptist Christian school. And that one of the things that affected me in my life and people didn't know is when someone from the South told me they came from a Christian school, I knew that they had gone to that school because their parents had pulled them out of school because they didn't want them to go to school with black kids. And many of my white colleagues didn't realize that because they were little kids and they were pulled out of their schools where they were comfortable and taken into the segregated, again, private segregated schools because their parents didn't want them to go to school with, with black kids. And it was a history lesson for the kids who were in the room, for the white kids who were in the room, and for the 90% black students who were in the room, and also for, for their teachers. Uh, and it was very cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. It's amazing that they also hadn't done their research. They had not <laughs> done their research. <laughs> um, wow, that, that is amazing. Um, also, I wanted to remind our, our audience and folks online, if there are any questions, to go ahead and type them in. Um, and do we have one from the... Uh... Yeah, we have one. Please go ahead. Uh, Raina asked if you guys could uh, please provide some advice on entering a career in security and uh, development if they're not taking the foreign service route. So a bit different from what you did, but if you have any advice about that. Some advice on careers in... In security and development. You know, there are careers in security and development that are not necessarily connected to the State Department. And I still do think the State Department is a, a wonderful option. I've had 35 years. Ambassador Perkins was my mentor. I don't know that he realizes the extent to which he mentored me, even by the knowledge of his history before I, I, I got to know him and work for him. And so I would encourage you to look for mentors who are working in uh, various fields of, of international affairs and national security, whether they're working for the UN, uh, they can be working for non-governmental organizations, Department of Defense, USAID. Uh, there are all kinds of options out there. And one of the best options that I refer young people to is Peace Corps. Uh, I am a strong advocate of Peace Corps. I never did Peace Corps, but my Peace Corps experience as a little girl in eighth grade has stayed with me for my entire life. And Peace Corps will give you the opportunity to delve into international affairs, but at the people-to-people -people level. And if you can succeed at that, you can parlay that into a successful career working in international affairs in any area. Any other questions from our audience, Facebook audience? Yeah, we had a question from, um, you guys have talked a lot about this, but this is from Kenneth Namdi, who I believe is in Nigeria, but he asked, for people who don't have, who don't come from elite backgrounds or elite families, uh, what are some routes to leadership in this field? Th that actually, that question reminds me of a, an article that you and, um, Ambassador Pickering wrote at the Washington Post back in 2015 about the Foreign Service being very white and how there needs to be work to diversify the Foreign Service. And you mentioned in that article that for generations, for decades, the Foreign Service kind of plucked people from elite institutions and universities that black people just didn't have access to. Um, uh, so 
I see there might be some connections with that question as well about, yeah, if you're not going to quote unquote elite institutions, um, what's that pathway into this profession? Well, if I were to say that uh, everything is peachy cream now, I would, I, <laughs> I would be telling you something that's not true. I think, uh, and something I'm doing and writing now, I, I did some research on where foreign service officers come from today. And today, a significant portion of them still come from uh, the East, the Ivy uh, community. But uh, there's an increase in and people coming from the South, from Texas, Georgia, Louisiana. And I've had uh, students call me from Atlanta, for example, or uh, Norman, Oklahoma, about coming into the Foreign Service. All kinds of colors. And they said, uh, I, somebody gave me your name and asked me to call you and ask you about the Foreign Service. Is it an elitist organization? Do I have a chance to get into it? And I said, uh, it's elitist, it's as elite as you want to make it. Which means that you need to think about why you want to be a Foreign Service officer. I can tell you why we need you, but you have to say why you want to come. And she said, I gave a lecture at one of the uh, colleges in, at the University of Oklahoma of not too long ago about the Foreign Service. And Wednesday I will, I will give a uh, on the line lecture with three students at, the, at that university who want to talk about the Foreign Service and their careers. And I think it's important to think about the Foreign Service as another career on the line that you can think about. But more importantly, I think the Foreign Service is like any other profession. One prepares for it. One researches it. And the best way to do it is, is to read, but also to get to know people who have been Foreign Service officers or who have had that kind of a career. And that's why I'm uh, uh, why I'm a uh, an advocate of uh, schools. Uh, when uh, Ambassador Linda was uh, Director General, she pushed hard for relations with educational institutions in places that nobody ever thinks about anymore or didn't think about before then. So it's important for people who want to be in the Foreign Service to think about people who might be able to help them. And that's all over. It's every career is like that. It's not just the Foreign Service. And that's the most important thing I can think. Get to know somebody who can tell you things. I get calls often from someone who said, Ambassador Perkins, do you know so-and-so at this place? I said, yes. Well, he asked me to call you and talk to you about coming into the Foreign Service. I said, okay. He said, she said, I didn't think you would talk to me. I said, well, what do you want to know? <laughs> and she said, well, can I just talk to her? I said, sure. And later on, her, uh, her dean called me and said, you know, she didn't think that someone like you would, would talk to someone like her. So I said, citizenship means just talking to people who are citizens. And I said, if she comes into foreign service and makes a hit of it, She's serving me just as she's serving herself. And that's the important thing.
So we're coming close to the end of our time, but there are two other questions that I wanted to touch on. And um, if we could bring up the, the last slide, look at another um, prominent African American from history. And that individual is uh, Dizzy Gillespie. And this is a question on cultural diplomacy. And so for those of you who may not know, Dizzy Gillespie in, I believe it was, yeah, 1956, jazz music became a critical tool in our diplomatic toolbox. This was in the part of the Cold War. There were parts of the world that were quite hostile to the United States. And a decision was made that um, one of the kind of shining um, contributions that America has made to the world is that of jazz music, which is a quintessentially African-American art form. And so Dizzy Gillespie was approached and asked if he, um, with the State Department, would go around the world as a cultural ambassador, um, sharing his music, um, his jazz music. And so he went to places like Iran and Syria, um, uh, Pakistan and, and Greece. And I believe the story in Greece was there had been like riots at the American Embassy and people were throwing stones and things at the American Embassy and going to Greece wasn't part of, I think, planned part of the tour, but they said, we gotta send Dizzy Gillespie and his band to Athens because things are really hot there and this might um, be a diplomatic success for us to kind of calm things down. Anyway, I, I, I really see, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I see this jazz diplomacy as really the, the, the first time that this concept of cultural diplomacy became prominent in, in American foreign policy. And so we have this picture up here on the, on the screen of Dizzy Gillespie, and uh, the first quote, um, touching on some of the things we talked about earlier, is he said, uh, when asked about this tour, he said, I sort of like the idea of representing America but I wasn't going over to apologize for the racist policies of America. So he had that, I think, was grappling with some of that as well and said, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it um, the way that I feel is right and, and fully represents all that is America, good and bad. And then he also said that, quote, jazz is our own American folk music that communicates with all people regardless of language or social barriers. And I think that quote you can apply to all forms of, of culture. And so my question to both of you is, I think specifically in recent years, there has, thank goodness, been a greater appreciation, understanding of the contributions of uh, African-American culture to the larger American concept of America, whether it's in music or in scholarship or literature or science, you name it. Um, there has been more recognition. Uh, and so my question to you is how have you seen aspects of African-American culture resonating in your work abroad? Um, when you were ambassador or doing trips abroad, what aspects of African-American culture do you feel have resonated the most with those communities? Well, certainly music. And as you were talking, I was thinking when hip hop and rap music started and us perennials, someone referred to my age group as perennials, uh, were kind of upset about this music, you know? And I, I would say to, to my kids, you know, I like music where I understand the words and I can remember the beat. And this hip hop stuff is just not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> well, you go all over the world now. There's not a country, Europe, Africa, Asia. I mean, during the Olympics, we had South Koreans doing hip hop on international television. And where did that start? It started in the African American community. And so it is a tool of diplomacy that I think helps people to understand and appreciate uh, the role that African Americans have played in American culture. And I have come very, with great difficulty to appreciate hip hop and rap as well. Do you, do you have a particular artist in particular that you uh, listen to? You know, it's funny. Uh, she's not hip hop and rap anymore, but I just love Mary J. Bly. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I love her new music, but I have now gone back to listen to her during her hip hop period, and uh, I'm getting there slowly. And also now an Oscar nominated actor yes. as well. So, yes. yeah, she, she, um, she hits home runs in all, in all yes. categories. Um, Ambassador Perkins, what about you and your travels, your work um, overseas? What aspects of African-American culture have you seen kind of resonating with folks? 
Well, certainly jazz. Uh, <clears throat> uh, believe it or not, uh, country music. Uh, but I had one experience which, which brought it home to me. Uh, when Namibia got its independence, I had just come back from South Africa. And the then uh, Secretary of State uh, had been uh, commissioned by the President to go to Namibia and witness the independence. And he called me and he said, look, I know you're a Director General now, but uh, I want you to get, go with me to Namibia. And then he said, uh, we have uh, an extra seat on the plane. There are two people who are vying for the seats. I said, well, who are they? He said, well, I, I probably won't tell you who, they are, who one of them is, but one of them is Dizzy Gillespie. I said, bring Dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> and Dizzy rode down with us on that plane, and Baker brought him up front in the main uh, cabin. And uh, before, before long, he and Baker, Baker was singing, and Dizzy was playing on his flute horn. And finally, uh, he asked a lot of questions. He, he wanted to know what my exper experience in South Africa had been, and the Foreign Service. So, so by the time uh, we got down to Winthrop, he said, well, Mr. Ambassador, I, I've uh, had another education just talking to you. Here's a picture of my autograph. He said, I'd be really pleased if you could find a place to hang it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have it. <laughs> I have it hanging in a little study that I use. One of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. We talked about everything you could think of. What a man. Wow. Wow. And when I think of people like that, I think of what a rich country the United States is. And we should never forget it. And we ought to promote it every time we possibly can and not be ashamed of it, but learn from it as well. Mm. Learn from it as well. Mm. That's great. What a plane ride. That's great. So the last question I want to, um, or I'm going to ask of you is, um, you mentioned the Peace Corps and how America is represented abroad. And I kept coming back to a story that my dad has told me many times. My dad grew up in Guyana, and he had a Peace Corps volunteer that came and worked in his community. And he said that was a transformative experience for him because this American came into his small community in Guyana. He'd never left the country before. And for those of you who don't know, Guyana is, is um, kind of part Afro-Guyanese, folks from African descent, and part Indo-Guyanese, folks from uh, Indian descent, and um, some Amerindian um, indigenous folks, so black and brown people in Guyana, not a lot of white people. Um, and this white American came, Peace Corps volunteer, and one of the first questions that he asked these students was, when you think of America, what do you think of? And I'm trying to figure out what year, this was probably 1950s or so. No, Peace Corps started at 61. 61, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> Big earlier Peace Corps, yes. Yeah. So 1960s, I was like, I don't want to date my dad too much. But um, so he said that the answer to this question, and my, my dad said that, oh, I think of a blonde haired, blue eyed person driving a red sports car um, on the beach because his exposure to the United States up to that point were these movies that just portrayed mostly white people on the beach driving sports cars. And the Peace Corps volunteer said, no, America's that and much more. Um, and it's people who have all different skin colors. Um, and people who live in this type of community or that type of community believe this or believe that. And that was a transformative experience for my dad um, as a young Guyanese kid. And 
So my question to, to you all, to, the kind of last thing to share with our audience, and it goes to what you were saying earlier, Ambassador Perkins, around why do you want to go into the Foreign Service, or why would someone want to go into the field of international affairs or diplomacy? And the question is, why is it important for more African Americans and people of color to be doing this work? Um, why should they look at this as a profession that needs them, um, that can only get better when it becomes more diverse and, 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 and kind of more representative? What is your sales pitch <laughs> to well, those who are considering it? Well, I think one of the uh, st uh, strongest points that we have to offer as a uh, nation is the concept of community. I think it's necessary that African Americans be given a chance to, to uh, represent their community. When we go as, as Foreign Service officers representing the United States, I say we represent the United States, but we also represent uh, 12 dozen communities, different kinds of communities that have different kinds of experiences and different kinds of values. I don't think the uh, African American community per se has been adequately portrayed in our foreign policy around the world. And I think there is a lot there to be uh, pitched. I think our Constitution will be a much more living Constitution as a result of this kind of presentation from all kinds of communities. Constitution, uh, I really do believe it is a, a living document, but the living part of it comes as a result of communities living the Constitution, understanding the Constitution. It's the backbone, and they'll make it stronger, make the Constitution stronger. That's the key. You know, one of the greatest strengths of, of our country, I would argue, is our diversity. And I don't think there are any other countries in the world that can reflect the broad diversity that exists in, in the United States. I remember uh, attending a meeting at the AU uh, with the Chinese, and the colleague uh, supporting me at that meeting was a Chinese American. And it was clear when the Chinese came in the room that they thought he was one of theirs. He didn't realize that he was there to represent the United States. And, there was a lot of fumbling going on, and I asked what was going on, and, and he said, they're trying to figure out who I am. And I said, come sit next to me, and they will know who you are. Mm -hmm. And I thought that sent a huge, huge message. Uh, the world needs to know that we value diversity so that they, too, can value the diversity that exists in their countries. And whether it's ethnic diversity or it's racial diversity, or its uh, economic diversity. All of those things bring different values to, to the table when you have people in the room. And I have always been uh, supportive of this. Uh, I was, and you probably read this, I was in Rwanda during the genocide. And I think that the reason I was in jeopardy is because even the Rwandans didn't realize a black person in the room could be a Foreign Service officer. And so everybody needs to know when a person walks in the room representing the United States, they represent the United States. And they need to know that we are a nation of many different views and that we are a nation of many different backgrounds. And that when you see America, you see a, a patchwork quilt of people who come from all places in the world. I didn't know you were originally from uh, Guyana. And I, I think that's an important fact. And it's not that 
you're not any more American than any of us who were born in America. We're all Americans when it comes down to the grid of it. And I think that gives the world a picture of our country that uh, we need to encourage and we need to promote. Well, I want to thank both of you tremendously from the bottom of my heart for taking the time today to sit with us, share with us your stories, your journeys, your experience, your insights are tremendously valuable um, for all of us that do not just do this work, but I think more broadly um, as well. So thank you so much, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, Ambassador Edward Perkins, um, for being with us today. And thanks to everyone who has joined us on Facebook Live. You've been listening and watching The Peace Frequency, a podcast series that taps into the stories of people across the globe who are making peace possible and finding ways to create a world without violence. Um, please, uh, you can see a, a recording of this. It'll be up on our podcast network soon and on YouTube as well. And so until our next episode, keep building, supporting, and learning peace.